As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have a returning guest tonight, one of our favorites, our activist farmer, Joel Salatin, co-founder of Polyface Farms in Virginia, is here with us again on Reluctant Preppers. Joel, welcome back to Reluctant Preppers. Thank you, Dunning. It's great to be with you. We love having you on here because it really gives us some uh, grounded sense of a positive uh, hope and a realistic experience and kind of breaks us, you know, Whenever you break the modern paradigm, it's it's almost as though you're a heretic, but you're you're saying things that we know inside already to be true, and it's almost like waking us up from a trance. And it's just so refreshing <laughs> to uh, to go, yeah, yeah, that's what common sense. Why am I been having to do the stupid way all the way? So we just just so grateful for you here talking to us about about ways that we can improve the uh, availability, accessibility, reliability, robustness, integrity, healthfulness of our food supply as people want to get aware and prepared. They're particularly concerned about food. That's that's a given. It's one of the number one top priorities on a lot of people's lists. So if you could talk us talk to us about why is local food come to the rescue when people are concerned about the fragility and the brittleness and the risks that are involved in being dependent on a long the long arm of the uh, supply chain that leads us to our, our most of our meals in the modern world. What are some considerations that you would like people to think about and uh, open up their minds about things, steps they can take to get, bring their food supply local? Sure. Well, yeah, it's a it's a great question, and I think at the at you know at the top it it just needs to be said that no civilization that failed to be able to feed for itself has survived. And I mean, we say that as a civilization, but the same thing it, 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 as you move down, you know, to a state, to a locality, uh, to a region. Whenever a whenever a region, a locality, um, uh, fails to be able to feed itself, it obviously becomes very very uh, vulnerable. And um, we have this idea that our you know, abundant supermarkets are indicative of just, uh, you know, a bulging uh, food supply. And, uh, and they are if everything works smoothly. But, you know, if you think about what it takes to get um, an item into the grocery store, a lot of things have to fall into place for that chain to occur. Um, you know, many of the things that we get, of course, are, are, are from even foreign countries. And so that requires, obviously, a functioning merchant marine. It makes sure the, the longshoremen aren't on strike. Uh, and, and of course, th- this is assuming that the food is, uh, you know, not tainted or not pathogenic, pathogenic or toxic or whatever. And then, you know, it, it goes into a, a, a warehouse. Well, in the warehouse, there are, you know, mountains and mountains of stuff stored with people running around. I mean, even the, the, the threat of bioterrorism, of, of somebody tainting something in these mountains of food sitting there for months um, by, you know, being run by forklifts, nameless, faceless people uh, that then finally go on a, on a truck and go across the country. Uh, depends on, you know, uh, uh, fuel, uh, trucking, um, workable roads, uh, all those things have to be in place. Finally gets to your grocery store, and of course, you know, all the economy and employment and cash registers and all those things have to be working. So, you know, the interesting thing is that today, I think the general rule is that any given city, <clears throat> any given locality, only has three days of food on hand. And you know, three days in any kind of calamity is uh, is actually not very long. And you know, a hundred years ago, if I went into your city and said, you know, "Where's the food?" Well, the food would have been in individual larders, in homes. It would have been in pantries and root cellars, and 
you know, uh, what was called the larder, which is, you know, where all the, the dried goods and, and uh, you know, a ham hanging up and that sort of thing were stored. Today, we don't even, most people have never even heard the word larder, don't even know what it means. And the food is out at the grocery store. Sounds like it's bad for your artery system and your your heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, larder. Yeah, it sounds sounds like fat, doesn't it? Um, and you know, just look at what happens when there's a hurricane warning, uh, a blizzard, an ice storm. I mean, the the you know next thing you know, the TV crews are in there showing these empty shelves, and and so this is actually the fact that we have exchanged. Our, our domestic larder for the grocery store down the street is not indicative of, of uh, security and progress. It's actually uh, indicative of almost uh, a, a hubris, uh, you know, a faith in, in ourselves that we can, you know, get along without uh, historically normal uh, procedures and a faith in, in this system that somehow this system is magically going to make everything appear. And so uh, while, while it's easy to think that we're in this new state of, you know, of, of euphoric plenty, we're actually in a new state of unprecedented vulnerability. And, and you know, that's, that's important, to, important to understand. And, and, and vulnerability not just to volume, but vulnerability to, you know, to tainting, to pathogenicity, to spoilage, to, you know, all these sorts of things. And, and uh, you know, this new language that we've all learned to say, uh, these new words, you know, Campylobacter, Listeria, E. coli, Salmonella, these kinds of things that weren't even in the, in the lexicon as, as, you know, early as just 30 years ago, are now... You know, all over the place. So you know, we haven't even we haven't even addressed the vulnerability of that. And so the the the, the truth is that when a locality is completely dependent on outside sources for food, that is a vulnerable locality. It doesn't matter whether it's in Phoenix or in Bangor, Maine, or in you know Hong Kong or your or your little you know uh, town in uh, Iowa. Um, you can be surrounded by fertility, but you can't eat soil. So you have to eat what the soil produces. And if your if your locality um, is is not producing you know edible stuff, then you know you're you're vulnerable. You mentioned uh, the the uh, tainting that can happen in long term storage. Ever since I was a kid and would visit supermarkets with my parents and now as an adult as well, uh, I've noticed, and people check your own memories about this, as you walk into the store or out of the store, especially if you ever duck past, like if they say, where's the restroom, what's behind these these, uh, hanging plastic flaps, you got to go in here and around there. If you ever get to see the back operation, or even if you think about it, sometimes down the main aisles, the foodstuffs being stored right alongside and up next to pesticides, uh, toxic chemicals, whether it's fertilizers or, <laughs> or household uh, cleaning chemicals or whatever, and just being intermixed. You can smell, you can smell the, uh, you know, the uh, bug killers and the fertilizers in the same aisle, and right across they got the, the animal crackers or whatever, and it's just like, uh, this, is, this is something that you have no visibility of uh, as, a, as a consumer, and yet this is part of the history of what you're bringing home and putting and feeding to your family. Sure, Cheerios and Cheerios and chlorine, you know, it's a, it's a real um, super uh, combination. So, so, so the truth, the, the the truth of the matter is, if this is a, if this is a vulnerable, fragile system, you know, how does how does local few local systems, you know, save us from that? And so, you know, while it's true that if you're in, you know, if you live in Indianapolis. Chances are your locality is not going to grow bananas and coffee. I, I, I get that, and there's always going to be trade. Historically, you know, the spice trade, of course, you know, dominated um, uh, international trade uh, for for many years. Why? Because spices are extremely um, uh, valuable, and you know, a little bit goes a long way. 
and so you can you know you can transport stuff that's that's that concentrated or valuable but you can't justify you know sending watermelons and squash and things uh, across the country it's, it's transporting too much water the stuff is like like you know hauling water across the country so um, so when I talk about local food systems I'm not saying that uh, that you know you can't you can't eat anything that's not available in right. the local area but but if, if you if you just brainstorm a minute and say you know and just close your eyes and imagine going down your local grocery store aisles and you say what could be grown here you know within a radius of just say 50 miles what could be grown here and the truth is that the lion's share of everything in there I, I do this exercise with people all the time when I go out and speak at you know foodie conferences and things and I just have them you know yell out to me and and when at the end of the day you know except for Kleenex and diapers maybe um, you know and, and a few you know citrus and and uh, and coffee, but you know all the grains, uh, many of the fruits, um, and and of course you know all of your dairy, all of your meat, all of your animal proteins, um, uh, pretty much all the vegetables. You know, this can all be grown locally, and it can be um, it, it, it it can be no. You, know, you can you can actually know where this stuff is. So as a you know, as an individual person, as a family, um, if you actually have a relationship with somebody in the community who's growing this stuff, when things go south, or if things went south, uh, you would actually have something above, something better than stampeding to the grocery, being another one of thousands of people trying to break in the doors and and clean off whatever's in the shelves you suddenly now can calmly um, uh, go out and visit your farmer or pick up the phone and give them a call and how's your inventory are we okay blah 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 and especially if you've buy, been buying in bulk like a half a beef or a half a hog and you have you know some storage some on-site storage things like that um, you know, if you've been like canning some meat that doesn't require refrigeration, the power goes off, uh, whatever. You know, these these are things. These are things that a prudent person does. One of the most um, interesting uh, things that I've ever seen and 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 have never forgotten it was down at Williamsburg, um, in Virginia. Next to Williamsburg is the Powhatan Village. And um, it's supposed to be a recreation of the way the Native American villages were, you know, when Chief Palatan, Pocahontas, and all that kind of stuff was going on. And uh, you go there, and they've got these, these, uh, uh, you know, huts. Um, yeah, they're, they're not they're not teepees. You know, the the, the iconic, you know, Lakota Sioux uh, that followed the the bison. Yeah, with sure. the, You know, the 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 real straight triangular teepee these are more kind of uh, um, squatty domes almost uh, with bent over saplings bent over saplings and uh, buffalo hide uh, covering them skins covering them and just a hole in the center you know the the chimney was was quite a, a tremendous civilizational development you know to, to get the smoke up out of the house out of your eyes out of your lungs and uh, anyway, smoke goes up in the and up in the lattice work of these things. Of course, they're all there are no nails, so all this lattice work is just lashed together with um, with cordage, uh, you know, probably cordage made from venison, you know, from uh, tendons and things, and uh, lashed together. And up in there is hanging, you know, fish and squash and corn and all of the food the family's food and it always struck me i mean it's one room right and so when you lie down at night with your beloved and you're looking up into this into the top you're actually lying there looking up into your provisions and you know um to me that that evokes two emotions one is a profound sense of dependency that that you know my my sustenance is is 
I'm dependent on this. You know, I'm, I'm very dependent on my on my ecology. I'm dependent on my uh, surroundings here. What I can what I can gather, what I can grow, what I can hunt, uh, those sorts of things. So there's a, there's a tremendous uh, dependency, but there's also the the you know flip side of that is an incredible sense of abundance and provision that you know look there's <laughs> there's what we've got for the next four months isn't that cool you know it's right there right above our heads and we're proximate to this to this bounty this this abundance that um, that we've been provided for and I think there's a real uh, almost a, a spiritual um, a spiritual whatever uh, satiation there to the, the idea of going and, and lying down with your beloved and being that proximate to this storehouse of food uh, there's a there's a great calm and a great um, uh, you know sense of sense of uh, of completeness and satisfaction in that and so I think the larder rather than being some sort of an archaic thing uh, a larder is is a powerful thing you know in our house I've written about this but when Teresa sends me shopping I don't go to the grocery store she gives me a list you know bring up two quarts of green beans three quarts of applesauce a quart of pickled beets and one of canned venison you know and I go to the basement we've got hundreds of quarts of, of um, canned goods down there and I I go down and I I go shopping you know I bring up the food from downstairs I mean the truth is that if everything collapsed you know we could we could live very very nicely for months and months um, on this storehouse of food and that isn't that isn't indicative of sitting here you know living like we're scared of tomorrow that's not why we do it uh, we just do it because this is the way humans have lived throughout history and it's simply a prudent way to live so anyway that's um, that's a little of, of my thinking and my feeling about it and and the why and how this you know how we can actually involve ourselves in a in a participatory way in uh, kind of digging ourselves out of our own uh, insecurity in our in our current day and uh, we were talking before we started the uh, interview about also about uh, nutrition and how that's connected with healthfulness uh, can you talk to us a little bit about your thoughts on people uh, imagining that some of the resources of the modern world might be unavailable, uh, food supply is part of it, and the medical system and some of the things that people rely on uh, for wellness for their family, um, at least in the modern world, we've gotten used to thinking we have to go pay a, pay a lot of money uh, for health, but what are some things to remember that have to do with uh, the this local food supply and locally grown things and fresh things and that's and how do you maintain your the health and wellness of your family how do you reduce the risk that you're going to need uh, you know emergency medical uh, assistance by just simple prudent things you can do at home too well <clears throat> uh, first of all I think that the quality of food changes dramatically when you move to uh, local food systems it, it it's a, it actually packs a lot more punch and so uh, for example I'll just give an example um, let's take eggs uh, for example uh, we we participated with a study done by a mother of news magazine back several years ago where 12 of us in the country sent our eggs off to a lab to get them uh, analyzed and um, I'll just I'll just uh, take out one ingredient. Uh, they, they measured about ten or twelve things. I can't remember what all of them were, but um, one of them was folic acid, which, uh, if you know anything about nutrition, is real important for pregnant uh, pregnancy, pregnant women. And uh, so the the regular you know supermarket egg, according to the USDA, uh, measures about forty eight micrograms of folic acid per egg. And our eggs measured 1,038. Holy so, smokes! Yeah, so I mean, this is this is not some little 10% deviation or 20% deviation. This is a you know this is a, a you know a multiplying you know uh, a kind of a deviation. The same thing is true with um, you know uh, grass-finished beef with 
riboflavin with um, conjugated linoleic acid, uh, the, poly, the, the fats, all the polyunsaturated, saturated, um, the, 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 the nutrient profile of, um, of non-industrial foodstuffs from vegetables to, you know, to meats and dairy and poultry, the nutrient profile is so profoundly different in, in uh, these you know, smaller systems and more ecologically friendly systems uh, or, or, or consistent systems, let's say, that the, that, that the product doesn't even look like it's the same thing. And, and so when you're, when you're in a stressed situation, you know, if, if everything's going great, you know, and the, you know, the NFL is still on, on the TV and the house is over your head and everything's uh, hunky-dory, um, some of these nutritional deficient or differences are not as essential but in a stressful situation, you know, if you're trying to, if, if you're trying to fight an, if you've scratched your hand and you've, you're trying to fight an infection, if you're um, emotionally uh, distraught about uh, you know, something that's going on, from, from, you know, political to economic to whatever, anyway, stress uh, on your body, you know, really is where these deficiencies, these differences, uh, tease out and become far more important than when everything's just rocking along smooth. And so, um, so while we obviously are a big proponent of of eating these foods while everything's hunky dory, um, it's even more important when they're not. Now, you know, you build up a head of steam if if you eat if you eat um, high quality foods when you're well, uh, then you actually you know build up what we call the immunological terrain uh, and so you know, anything that's functioning better than normal is able to withstand shocks you know, as it goes through if you're already breaking down then certainly you're not as able to you know to withstand shocks and so you know one of the you know one of the uh, best things that people can do for health and wellness to prepare for a downturn, whatever that downturn may be, is to simply maintain your own uh, body's fuel at a very high plane of efficacy. And if if that if that body's plane of fuel is good, and you're and you go into the whatever the crisis is, if you go into that crisis on a high plane of functionality. You have a lot better chance of withstanding whatever the shocks are if you go in with some, uh, you know, a little bit of um, um, wellness equity in your tank, if you will. You bet. Then, then if you know, then if you go in already having problems due to you know drinking three soda pops a day and smoking a pack of cigarettes and living on Cheerios and Cocoa Puffs and Velveeta. You know, that's an interesting aspect that I don't know that anyone we've talked with has mentioned over the past three and a half years we've been doing this. If I can just recap what, what you just said, because it just stands out like a, like a beacon here. Everybody talks about storing up supplies. Uh, people have talked about storing up tools, whether that's, uh, def- you know, self-defense tools or or uh, practical other you know implements for for getting work done uh, people have talked about storing up precious metals or money and that sort of thing people have talked about building uh, skills which is absolutely practical and building relationships but i think this is the first time we even had somebody talked about storing you know emergency medical supplies but this is the first time anybody's mentioned about a, a prepping or preparedness means storing up health and wellness in your body's uh, nutritional profile uh, of really being highly, uh, uh, I don't know how to say this exactly, but basically what you were saying about having a a very effective and uh, and robust nutritional, uh, nutritionally sound body is one way of starting off any difficult situation rather than starting from a place of of near depletion and uh, on the borderline of ill health that's very, very profound, and so simple, and so close to close to home. <laughs> well, it, it, it is, and, and you know what's what's wonderful about it is that it 
in a lot of ways, it's one of the one of the more easy uh, things to do, um, just because you know you're not talking about a radical change of life. You're not even talking about changing your menu. You're talking about maybe changing changing ingredients, but um, but you're not talking about some of these other you know going to a class to develop a skill set or whatever, and and so. Um, when you talk about bang for the buck, or you know, or or, or you know, kick for the effort, um, I think that actually, you know, creating creating um, you know wellness equity, storing that up in our our body's you know savings account, if you will, uh, has got to be uh, as <laughs> as good as any, um, you know, preparation anybody could make for a, for a downturn. Well, Joel, I think that we covered the, the main topics that we set out to tonight as far as what are the, what are the advantages of uh, local food and how does, a, how does the brittleness of the long-distance uh, supply chain, uh, how can we do better than that? Is there anything on this topic that you think uh, you'd like to add for our audience before we sign off? Well, I think the only thing that, that might be worth mentioning, we haven't really... I think in times past we've talked about things that you can do for yourself, but I can't I can't help but just reiterate that here as we talk about local food. It's not just about uh, going and 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 buying local food and knowing your local farmer. It, it it's also about doing for yourself what you can do. Now some people, you know, are in a situation where it's, it's difficult to do much for yourself, but. Um, but those who can't, whether you have a, a, a from a postage stamp yard to a front patio to you know a southern a southern exposure on your house that you could build a little solarium on. I mean, this evening at, at, at dinner, you know, we're we're here we're in Virginia. You know, last week we were ice skating on the pond, and uh, at dinner this evening we had fresh salad out of the garden that's under a um, uh, under a, a, a double layered cloak. And you know we've had we've had uh, we had two degrees last week a couple of nights it's like we were uh, ice skating on the pond, but with this protective cover on it, the vegetables, the the greens, the salads in the garden um, were not killed. No, they're not growing very fast, but they're not dead, and we're enjoying them right now. So there is a tremendous amount that a person can do when you you know when you really look at at food and nutrition close to home and realize that this is not some pie in the sky out in the space thing but actually something that's very very practical and and when we realize that linked up to the practical aspect of of storing up storing up health um it becomes even more you know even more practical and and yields more interest more dividends than uh than just you know buying local and again, as we've talked about as well, uh, where, it's just where I thought you might be going with this is you, it puts you in a position where you are, you can be able to help others. You're, these people that you're in relationships with, you mentioned knowing who you're, know your farmer, know your food. Um, these people that you're in relationships with, you can help each other. And by being a small time producer yourself, it, it gives you something to barter with, uh, that may be different from what other people have as well. So you can help them as, as you get, uh, help your family at the same time. So, well, Joel, uh, we just love having you on here and we, we'll have you back again if, if we certainly can. And, uh, just, uh, thank you for making this work. I know you had some big storms there this week and we had trouble getting our communications to work earlier, but we, we circled back around and got it to work. So, uh, just so grateful for having you back here with us again on Reluctant Preppers. Super. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you.